Buy medicine before you go. That advice from the first game comes back this week. We'll also get some smithing done, bother the average middle-aged man, and slip and slide our way through the most complex dungeon yet, the Ice Palace. After acquiring the Titan Smith from Thieves Town, there are few places we can't go within Hyrule. That means there are a number of side quests and optional items that players can now obtain. I only tackled a few side quests this play session, and I didn't have to travel far from the Village of Outcasts to do it. On the southern end of the village, near where the library is in the Light World, we'll find a group of dark colored stone skulls encircling a frog. We can now lift these skulls and other dark colored stones. As with many of the strange characters we meet in the Dark World, this is another Light World resident who somehow got stuck here. He tells us he used to live in Kakariko. He says his partner must miss him. This should trigger the memory from a past hint found in the village. A blacksmith on the eastern outskirts of the village says he could temper Link's sword if his partner ever returns. Using the mirror, we travel back to the Light World and to the blacksmiths. Once the two smithies are reunited, they make good on their offer to temper Link's sword. They have to take the sword a while to do it. Without a sword, it's a good idea not to stray too far from Kakariko Village. Luckily, just outside the blacksmith shop, there's a wooden peg that can be knocked down with a hammer. With that peg out of the way, Link can fall down a hole to find a strange statue. It depicts two dragons encircling a pair of giant hands holding a red gem. Putting magic powder on this statue causes a bat to appear. Many sources refer to this character as the Mad Batter. However, the Link's Awakening remake on Nintendo Switch refers to him as Lil Devil. If the latter's a more accurate translation from the original Japanese, I don't know. The Mad Batter grumps at Link for waking him up, and then sarcastically thanks him. It will then, somewhat reluctantly, tell Link he will curse him. It fires a bolt of lightning at him. The curse turns out to actually be a good thing. From here on out, Link's magic spells cost half as much as usual. Nice. After a quick trip to Kakariko proper, then back to the smithy, Link can reclaim his sword. The tempered master sword hits harder than the standard blade, which will come in handy as we head into the later dungeons. After getting the sword back, it's back to the Dark World. In place of the blacksmith shop, there's a bombed out building. Inside is an unusual chest. It's blue in color. When Link approaches it, a message says there's a key locked inside and the chest can never be opened. Link takes this chest with him. Earlier in the game, just outside the Desert of Mystery, Link encountered a man who sat silently next to a sign. The sign urged everyone to ignore him, referring to him as the average middle-aged man. Elsewhere, a thief told Link that this man is an ex-member of their gang. When Link approaches the middle-aged man with the chest now in tow, he speaks. He says he heard Link knows he used to be a thief. He offers to open the chest in exchange for Link's silence about his past. If you promise not to tell, the chest is opened and Link is given the magic bottle that was inside. Now to the Ice Palace. The frozen dungeon sits in the center of the Dark World equivalent of Lake Hylia. A wall surrounds the structure. It has no gates or doors, meaning there's no way to get inside, at least not from the Dark World. If players travel to the Light World, they can make their way in. Just outside the Pond of Happiness, there's a dark-colored stone which can be lifted with the Titan's Mitt. Under this rock is a portal to the Dark World. Walking through it transports Link inside the walls of the Ice Palace, and from there he can go inside. The Ice Palace is easily the most difficult and most complex dungeon to this point. It spans eight floors, one on the ground level and seven basement level floors. The seventh basement is the boss room. Let's pause here. I generally work to hit the highlights of the dungeon, talking about the elements and areas that stand out to me. I know I don't always succeed at that and just kind of give a blow by blow of my dungeons, I'm not going to be doing that here. But I will say that the Ice Palace relies heavily on players being able to remember specific locations and navigate to them in order to solve the dungeon's puzzles. There are many individual rooms that did not strike me enough to write about them as a standout, but frankly players will have to know them and have some knowledge of the layout to be successful here. So please forgive me if this seemed somewhat a little more sketchy. I'm going to try to describe elements that require players to keep a mental map of the dungeon in their minds without fully describing the map. It's also worth noting that the Ice Palace is not separated into two distinct sections as other dungeons in the game were. There is a big key door inside this dungeon, but players will still backtrack into past areas even after passing through this door. Let's begin. 
In the first room, there's a hint tile that tells players that magical flames will protect them in this dungeon. An ice creature emerges from the bas relief sculpture on the wall. It can only be defeated with the fire rod. Once the creature melts away, a door opens, allowing players to dive deeper into the dungeon. Because magic will be essential to this dungeon, it's a good idea to go in with some potion that'll help refill your magic meter. In other words, buy medicine before you go. Players will soon discover that some rooms feature slick, smooth, icy floors. These floors are a brighter blue and have a grid pattern on them in contrast to other floors in the dungeon. Players will also quickly come across a cross-shaped room with a pattern of five blocks in the intersection at the center. The center block can be pushed, but the structure of the room limits the direction that players can travel. They're forced south to a room which contains the compass. The room to the east is a dead end. There is a chest visible in that room, but it clearly can only be accessed from a lower room of the dungeon. Forced back to the cross-shaped room, players can then move north. Inside the room to the north, three walls surround a cracked floor in the center of the room. Players will have to manipulate a crystal switch to travel further north into the room, and also reach the cracked floor in the center of the room. Players must first hit the switch to lower the blue blocks, then place a bomb next to the switch. The explosion will trigger the switch once players are on the other side of the blue blocks. This allows them to place a bomb on the cracked floor to make a hole in the center and descend deeper into the dungeon. Down a level, players will encounter a large skeleton enemy called a Stealthos Knight. This enemy collapses into a pile of bones when hit, but it will reassemble itself after a moment. The knight cannot be killed by the sword. A hint tile on the wall explains a second weapon is needed. Players need to collapse the knight, then place a bomb on the bones to blow them up. This is the first time we see this mechanic for defeating a Stalfos enemy in a Zelda game. The requirement of using a bomb will appear off and on as the series continues. A second cross-shaped room on basement level 3 also stood out to me. It features a giant spike trap, which behaves like the classic spike traps from the original game. In that game, the traps hurled themselves at Link when he's in direct line of sight. Traps elsewhere in this game have either bounced between two points in a room, or have sat completely still. Players must trigger the giant trap, move out of the way to avoid getting hit, and then take a branch of the cross they want to tackle. Other giant spike traps will appear elsewhere in this dungeon as well. The next section of Note For Me starts with a U-shaped room with a spiked floor blocking access to a door. Players can get over the spikes by using a hookshot on a skull. Up the stairs is a room with pegs that are just asking to be hit with a hammer. There's also a giant block to be lifted and a couple of switches. One switch is on the floor under a skull. It reveals a chest containing the dungeon map. The other is a statue with its tongue sticking out. Link can pull the tongue out further to open a door. Through the door, players will find a set of stairs that leads to the earlier unreachable treasure chest. It contains the big key. Backtracking to the room with a spiked floor, a switch is found under the skull we latched onto with the hookshot earlier. This switch reveals a chest with a key inside. Through a locked door on the west side of the room, we find a room with a hole on the floor to the east and a cracked floor on the west. Two ice monsters emerge from the wall. Once they are defeated, a chest appears with some bombs. This should tip players off to the fact that they need to use a bomb on the cracked floor to the west. A hole appears. After dropping through the floor, Link lands right in front of the big chest. Inside is the blue mail. This is a defense upgrade. Link takes less damage while wearing it. It's also technically optional, marking the first time that there's an optional item within a dungeon in this game. Heading east, players will reach a room with a big key door. In the center of the room is a hole lined with pushable blocks. Link, however, can't reach the blocks or the hole because of raised blue blocks from a crystal switch. This is a setup for the most complex and involved puzzle in the dungeon, maybe in the whole game. Heading through the big key door, and another locked door, players descend further into the dungeon, eventually reaching a wide open room with a skull near the middle. A switch under the skull will not stay pressed. There's nothing in the room to place on top of the switch. A locked door to the east leads to a room with a crystal switch. We need to switch it to drop the blue blocks and then loop back through the dungeon to reach the room with the big key door. Making the loop will involve dropping down a hole in the big chest room again. And once we're back to the big key door room, Link can push a block from the left side of the hole and then drop down after it. That block can then be pushed onto the switch to open the door to the south. If players try to push down blocks from the right side of the hole and then drop down, they'll find those blocks just don't reach the switch. To reach the boss room, Link will need to move a statue and lift a giant block to reveal a hole in the floor. The boss is called Cold Stair. It's a pink cloud with a large eye locked in a giant block of ice. The ice can be melted with the fire rod. Once the ice is gone, the eye in the center multiplies, becoming three. It takes a few hits from the sword to take each eye down. I didn't find the fight too difficult. Once Cold Stare is no more, Link receives a heart container and the fifth maiden is freed.
This maiden mentions that once Ganon is defeated, the Dark World will disappear, and the Triforce will await a new holder. Just two more maidens to go. Next week we'll visit a ghostly grove, flex our musical muscle, and venture into the Swamp of Evil to tackle the sixth dungeon of the game, Misery Mire. If you haven't already, please subscribe and follow along. Please also consider sharing this podcast with a friend. I'm Paul Riley. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Thank you.